Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to your conference. I uh, feel very honored and I uh, wish I could be there. Many of you might be wondering actually who I am. Um, my name is Carrie Gillum. I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for more than 30 years. I spent most of my career with Reuters International News Agency. And in that role, I was assigned to cover a company you might have heard of called Monsanto. It was 1998 and Monsanto had just introduced uh, these new genetically engineered crops that were revolutionizing agriculture. And Reuters asked me to move to Kansas and start spending a lot of time with farmers and with Monsanto and other companies that were selling these new GMO seeds and pesticides that went along with them. And I've learned a lot over these last 22 years and I'm gonna share some of that with you today. One thing that I most certainly learned was how crucial agriculture is to our entire well being. Uh, there is nothing more essential to our health than food, uh, clearly. So I feel very fortunate to have spent so much time uh, researching and writing about this industry. Change slides. So uh, in 2017, I put a lot of what I uh, learned into a book I called Whitewash. And this is a story of a weed killer cancer and the corruption of science. And we're going to talk a lot about the chemical that I wrote about here, glyphosate and Monsanto. But what I really want people to understand is that uh, Monsanto is really only the poster child, I think, for a much larger problem that we have with pesticides in agriculture in the world right now slide. At the beginning of my uh, book, I use this quote, agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will, in the end, contribute most to real wealth, good morals, and happiness. The agricultural sector is one of the most important sectors in Thailand, uh, just as it is in the United States, generates food and living incomes for a number of Thai people. Um, and it's a, a big country, Thai is a big country for exporting rice and vegetables and other sorts of uh, products. So it's very important uh, to know how the food is made and what the impacts are of pesticide use. So we'll do a slide here. We talk about modern industrial agriculture and what I like to say is the insanity of so-called modern industrial agriculture. We're seeing corporate control of seed germplasm availability and pricing. We're seeing herbicide dependence growing around the world. We're seeing the degradation of the health of our soil, we're seeing contamination of water, loss of species and pollinators, and we're seeing a rise of cancers and other diseases. Slide. At the heart of all of this ins insanity, I would make the case, are pesticides. Now, pesticides um, are used not only in agriculture, but of course by residents and cities and counties and schools. They're used to do things like kill weeds or insects um, or plant diseases. In Thailand, pesticide use has jumped over the last decade for use in food production, just as it has in many countries around the world. Slide. But we need to look at some what I call not so fun facts uh, associated with pesticide use. Here are some, approximately 5.6 billion pounds of pesticides are used worldwide each year, largely in agriculture. Research has tied pesticides to a range of health problems, including reproductive and neurodevelopmental harms, kidney, liver diseases, and cancers. Cancer has become all too common. I know this personally because my father died from cancer just uh, at the end of October. Uh, it was a very short uh, and brutal battle with the disease. But he is just one of millions of people around the world. Every year, roughly 17 million people worldwide are diagnosed with cancer. More than 9 million people die from cancer each year. And children, sadly, are seeing more and more cancer uh, in their ranks. In Thailand, you have a 16% chance of getting cancer before the age of 75. It's a lot better than in America, where the cancer risk in one's lifetime is close to 40%. Our U.S. National, National Toxicology Program uh, in America tells us that there are many, many causes, of course, for cancer and disease, but one is environmental contaminants, including pesticides, and we must address these issues if we want to address these illnesses. Research suggests a connection between pesticides 
and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, multiple myeloma, prostate, liver, pancreatic, lung, and other types of cancers. Slide. In children under five years old, cancer rates are increasing for childhood leukemia, brain tumors, and rare liver tumors. The World Health Organization has tried to put out a warning. Slide. Pediatricians are also putting out warnings. Pediatricians are concerned about childhood pesticide exposure. In the US, our American Academy of Pediatrics has been calling for greater protections from toxic exposures for children. What we see here is just an abundant amount of research that shows that pesticide intake, whether it be through the diet or through occupational exposure, can be very detrimental, um, not only with cancers and diseases, but when it comes to reproductive health and fertility. This is a study um, that was done in 2018 and published in 2018 from Harvard researchers showing that high consumption of high pesticide residues was associated with lower probabilities of pregnancy and live birth. And this is strictly from dietary exposure to pesticides. Slide. The United Nations has joined in as well, calling for a comprehensive new global treaty to regulate and phase out the use of dangerous pesticides in farming and try to move to more sustainable agricultural practices. And this is, this is so key, and you've heard so many people talk about this, but it's, it's really about the health of our future generations, you know, our children, uh, the health of our species, of our water, of our air. Uh, it's vital that we understand the use of pesticides and what it is doing to our health and our environment. Slide. Now, Thailand, um, you guys are smarter uh, here, perhaps, than we are in America. Uh, you, your government was trying to ban uh, these three uh, pesticides not too long ago, chlorpyrifos, uh, paraquat, and glyphosate, um, all which have their own um, specific dangers and hazards. What happened, however, was our U.S. government said, no, we don't want Thailand to ban these, specifically glyphosate. Now, Thailand, as we said, had good reason. Your uh, scientists looked at the fact that glyphosate causes cancer, kidney and liver problems, and reproductive problems, according to scientific research. Chlorpyrifos, uh, the science is, is uh, overwhelming on the dangers of chlorpyrifos to children, uh, impacts childhood brain development, damages cognitive function. And then paraquat is just an extremely toxic and extremely dangerous uh, herbicide that many farmers used uh, even before glyphosate. But paraquat is so dangerous because it's known that if you even just ingest a small amount accidentally, you could be dead within weeks. Um, exposure is also tied to Parkinson's disease and birth defects. Um, so, you know, as I said at, at the beginning of this, there are a lot of known dangers to pesticides, but when you try to regulate or restrict them, you run into a brick wall. And this is what we saw happen in Thailand as well. Monsanto, which is now owned by Bayer, uh, reached out to our U.S. government, to the State Department and others, and pressured them to in turn pressure Thailand's government to drop the ban proposed for glyphosate. Um, it, was, it was all done rather secretively, uh, but we have emails that show uh, Bayer pressuring the U.S. government to convince Thailand not to ban glyphosate. And as you know, sitting here today, um, it is still uh, able to be used in food and farming. This is an interesting email slide here, a new slide. An interesting email that we uh, were able to obtain at US Right to Know in my work there. Uh, this is the White House, and this was a consulting group um, that was doing some intelligence for Monsanto and for Bayer. And they wanted to know if the White House was going to have Monsanto's back. And they got the word that, yes, the White House under Trump administration said, we have Monsanto's back on pesticides. Slide. So we're going to get into a, a lot of discussion here specifically about Monsanto and about glyphosate, um, because I really think there's no better example of deceptive practices and the power in the strategic deception uh, that has gone on by Monsanto uh, for more than 40 years to try to convince regulators and lawmakers and consumers and farmers that glyphosate and Roundup products are completely safe when the science shows otherwise. Slide. 
In 2015, um, as all of you probably know, uh, you've been paying attention to glyphosate issues, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, looked at uh, years of literature, uh, published peer-reviewed data, uh, epidemiology, toxicology, mechanistic data, and examined and assessed to determine how to classify glyphosate. And what they came up with was a determination that it was a probable human carcinogen based on differing levels of evidence in these different human and animal studies and mechanistic data. Following this classification in March of 2015, slide, you can see uh, that numerous people in the US filed lawsuits. Uh, over 100,000 people have now brought lawsuits uh, in the United States against Monsanto and by extension, Bayer, which bought Monsanto in 2018. And these lawsuits all are very similar. They all allege that Monsanto's Roundup or other glyphosate herbicides caused them to develop non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And importantly, they allege that Monsanto knew about the risks, the cancer risks, but covered up the risks. Three trials have been completed so far. Um, all three uh, trials have been found in favor of the plaintiffs. Uh, the juries have all found that Monsanto acted with malice in hiding the risks of its herbicides. And they had some very, very large verdicts, um, although a lot of those have been uh, cut down by judges in appeals. Um, so what we learned through this litigation uh, was quite a lot, actually. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of pages of documents that Monsanto had to turn over in discovery. And these were internal emails and reports and other communications um, that showed Monsanto interacting internally as well as with regulators and others. And what we've seen here, uh, we now call the Monsanto papers. If we want to change slides. Um, and from these Monsanto papers, uh, we learned quite a bit. And here are some comments from judges who were overseeing the trial. This is a federal judge, Judge Shabria. There's a fair amount of evidence that the only thing Monsanto cared about was undermining the people who were raising concerns about whether Roundup caused cancer. Monsanto didn't seem concerned at all about getting at the truth of whether glyphosate caused cancer. And this was really a good summary of what so many other people said, jurors and judges and people who watched the trials. The evidence was pretty overwhelming um, that Monsanto had been hiding a lot of information uh, about the risks of its herbicides. What we see in some of the papers, if you turn to another slide here, um, are, are just so many examples of the strategies uh, that Monsanto and allies employed to influence regulators and confuse and mislead consumers. So what we saw through the documents, we see uh, Monsanto engaging in ghostwriting research papers, and these papers asserted the safety of glyphosate and were used to convince lawmakers and regulators and others. Uh, we see financial ties between Monsanto and other chemical companies and editors at scientific journals. We see front groups that were set up um, by Monsanto and others in the industry and funded secretly um, so that they could advocate for the safety of Monsanto's products without looking like they were aligned with Monsanto. Um, and we saw public relations teams um, that Monsanto hired to ghostwrite articles and blogs um, that would look like they were written by prominent uh, independent scientists or influential academics. Um, so this is, this is again just a small part um, of, of a web that was woven around the world uh, to try to mislead people. Um, but I'd like to show you some of it if I can. If you move to another slide, you'll see here, here's one email. Now this is back from 2002. And you have to remember that Monsanto has always said that its uh, glyphosate herbicides are so very safe and uh, don't cause cancer, don't cause disease, uh, don't cause reproductive harms. But internally, you see emails like this one um, from Monsanto's top scientist, Bill Hydens. My primary concern is with the glyphosate in terms of the potential for this work to blow Roundup risk evaluations, getting a much higher dermal penetration than we've seen before. This was an area that Monsanto was concerned about, as we see in the documents. 
um, how fast glyphosate could absorb into the skin and get into the bloodstream and move throughout the body. This was something that they were worried about uh, regulators finding out about. Change uh, slides again. Here's another one you see. This is 2003, Donna Farmer, another scientist. She's saying the term glyphosate and Roundup cannot be used interchangeably. You cannot say Roundup is not a carcinogen. We've not done the necessary testing on the formulation to make that statement. And this document and many others like it made clear uh, something that many of us, I guess, had known and that we talked about in the book, but consumers don't, don't generally understand this. Uh, Monsanto was never required to really do extensive carcinogenicity testing on its formulated products, on Roundup or Ranger Pro or all of the other things that are lined on store shelves or that farmers use to spray on our food. The company was never required to do long-term studies on those formulations. They were only required to do the, the long-term studies on the active ingredient glyphosate. And what scientists have found is that it's actually the formulations that have additional ingredients and surfactants and other chemicals in them um, that are causing or have been causing a lot of the human health problems. Slide. This is interesting. These emails um, show that Monsanto was very worried before the International Agency for Research on Cancer uh, even met to classify glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. This is in 2014 and Monsanto has just learned here that IARC is going to look at the literature, the independent literature on glyphosate. And you can see they say, oh my, what we have been concerned about has happened. Glyphosate is on for IARC review. We have vulnerability in the area of epidemiology, exposure, genotox, mode of action. You see in these emails that Monsanto was very worried about what IARC was going to find when they took a hard look at glyphosate. Slide. Monsanto actually understood their vulnerability so well that they predicted the possible or probable human carcinogen rating. They guessed it would be one or the other because they knew how much evidence there was of carcinogenicity tied to Roundup and glyphosate. Slide. And so what they did, and again, all of this is before IARC even met or issued its classification, Monsanto decided that they were going to orchestrate outcry with IARC. They were going to try to discredit the IARC scientists. So this was a plan that they put in place. This was about a month before IARC classified glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. And the game plan was going to include you know, press releases and statements from Monsanto officials, but also this sort of secret use of third parties and uh, ghost-written articles and uh, blogs and, and people that look like they're independent, but actually were getting their marching orders from Monsanto. Slide. Let's look at ghostwriting just a little bit more in depth. So this is, um, this is from the year 2000, and I apologize for all of the, the details here, but uh, I think they're so important. This, there was a study that came out called, a paper called Williams, Crows, and Monroe. Those were the authors. And this paper was incredibly important for Monsanto in terms of asserting that there were no problems, no human health problems whatsoever associated with Monsanto's products. And this paper was deemed to be independent, yet we see through all these internal emails uh, that Monsanto's scientists worked on this for three years. And when they were finished, they congratulated themselves for all of their hard work and they even had a celebratory sort of get together where they got polo shirts um, for the team to celebrate all their hard work on this so-called independent paper. And you can see in this email, one of the Monsanto officials says, our plan now is to utilize it both in the defense of Roundup and Roundup Ready crops worldwide and in our ability to competitively differentiate ourselves from generics. This was all, all scripted uh, and ghostwritten by Monsanto. And we found these in the emails. This is the actual paper, William Crows and Monroe, and these were the conclusions. Roundup herbicide does not pose a health risk to humans. There were no effects on fertility or reproductive parameters, and it was concluded glyphosate is non-carcinogenic. No one knew that this paper was actually ghostwritten by Monsanto officials until, slide, until this email came out in 2015. This is 
This is again right before IARC. And Monsanto scientists are trying to figure out what to do. And so they decide that it would be a good idea to ghostwrite a research paper that will contradict IARC's classification. And they say, you know, we can add these scientists, we can add Grime or Peer or Kirkland, uh, we can ghostwrite the exposure talks and genotox sections. We'll be keeping the cost down by us doing the writing, and they would just edit and sign their names, so to speak. Recall that is how we handled William Crows and Monroe. This shows us that ghostwriting of research papers inside Monsanto had been going on for years. Slide. And this is the finished product of a ghostwritten paper that they uh, put together that did in fact contradict IARC. Um, this was published in the September 2016, a review of the carcinogenic potential of glyphosate by four independent expert panels. They, they came out and said that IARC was wrong. The um, acknowledgement said neither any Monsanto company employees nor any attorney reviewed any of the expert panels manuscripts. And yet we know from the emails that Monsanto was hard at work ghostwriting these papers. This is another example slide of ghostwriting. Um, this was Monsanto was caught ghostwriting um, an article published in Forbes magazine. Uh, and we can see from internal emails um, going back and forth where Monsanto was doing the draft and passing it back and forth to uh, this academic Henry Miller whose name uh, ultimately was on it. And, and when, this, when, when he was caught, uh, you know, Forbes did come back and, and did delete the articles. Um, the New York Times did a big story about it. But again, you know, this is only one, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is only one individual that we've caught. And uh, we know that there are networks of, of others all around the world. Slide. This is more, this is um, from testimony given in a deposition from one of Monsanto's lawyers in which he's talking about how Monsanto used um, a group in Washington, D.C., a consultant called Potomac. Uh, and they used Potomac to write letters to the editor um, that could appear in newspapers all around the United States. And they would appear to be written by people who were independent uh, of Monsanto. You can see here they say, uh, we know these items in the media need to be from those outside uh, the industry. And yet you see here how Monsanto was writing those. Slide, front groups. Um, this is very important because it's the front groups that help Monsanto carry out uh, the secretive ghostwritten messages and also lobby and uh, try to mislead consumers and, and lawmakers and others uh, while appearing to be independent. So here's a list of um, some of the top ones. You have the American Council on Science and Health. You have Academics Review, Genetic Literacy Project. Um, this is an interesting one, Campaign for Accuracy in Public Health Research. Uh, that was set up right after IARC, uh, specifically to, to discredit IARC. Many more, slide. About the American Council on Science and Health. Let's just talk about them for a minute. They're very active. Uh, and they have articles that appear uh, all over the world. Uh, they're quite prolific. Uh, they say that they are a pro-science consumer advocacy organization uh, to publicly support evidence-based science and medicine. And they say, we do not represent any industry. Slide. Yet internal emails um, show us uh, that they work very closely and in fact rely on money funding from Monsanto and other big companies. Here's an email in 2015 uh, from ACSH to Monsanto saying, each and every day we work hard to prove our worth to companies such as Monsanto. And they're asking for more money. And you can see in this next slide, Monsanto's response is uh, that yes, we're gonna give them money and uh, you will not get a better value for your dollar than ACSH, according to this Monsanto executive. Um, and yet they don't disclose any of this. Uh, they say they're independent. Um, this is what you get. Um, if you look at these slides, ACSH uh, writes articles trying to discredit journalists, um, scientists, others. Danny uh, Hakim and Eric Lipton are both very well-known uh, journalists that work for the New York Times. And ACSH just uh, attacked and harassed them mercilessly when they were writing about glyphosate. Slide. 
Uh, this is another front group genetic literacy project. This is one of the scientists uh, who sat on the IARC um, um, group that reviewed glyphosate. Uh, they have also attacked him, Chris Portier, uh, saying he has a history of lying. These are all front groups that try to look like they're not uh, part of Monsanto saying these things. Slide. Here's another group, uh, Academics Review. Again, this is an organization that uh, has purported to be independent. Yet we have emails uh, showing uh, Monsanto sending money, Monsanto being involved in actually setting up the organization and saying the key will be keeping Monsanto in the background so as not to harm the credibility of the information. So you have Academics Review, secretly funded. And this is what you get from Academics Review, again, attacking the cancer organization. IR glyphosate cancer review fails on multiple fronts, according to Academics Review, uh, which does not disclose its funding. Manipulating media and lawmakers. Uh, this has been a, one that has been very personal to me that I have uh, definitely felt uh, and understood. Um, slide. Uh, you can contrast my experiences of being harassed and uh, attempted to intimidate me and discredit me with um, this woman, Kate Kelland from Reuters in London. Uh, when Monsanto was trying to discredit the International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, they really started pushing um, a series of stories, um, including many with false narratives trying to get certain journalists to pick up and write these stories. And Kate Kelland was one who did exactly as asked, uh, according to the emails that we have seen uh, internally between Monsanto and even some between Monsanto and, and Kate Kelland. Uh, she wrote these articles um, that, were, that were planted essentially by consultants for Monsanto that were saying that the IARC scientists you know, were wrong or in, engaged in misbehavior um, and really, really gave a lot of scrutiny um, to this International Cancer Agency slide. We see here then that Monsanto used those articles to go to US Congress and to try to get uh, funding stripped away from the International Cancer Agency really using the media as a tool to get the lawmakers to pressure um, this international cancer group. Slide. In contrast, uh, what they did with me <laughs> when they you know, started seeing my book and my articles raising concerns and I was writing about the science uh, that showed that uh, glyphosate may cause cancer, uh, what they did with me was they, they set about trying to discredit me, ruin my career, harass me, um, negative reviews about my book, uh, that sort of thing. And there were a whole lot of art and emails and communications that came out. And this was an article in The Guardian that showed that they targeted not just me, um, but many others as well. Slide. Here is part of the harassment, ACSH, our favorite front group, um, also saying that I'm lying early and often. And there are dozens of articles like this that ACSH has put out. Slide. So amidst all of this, you know, misdirection and misrepresentation and deception and ghostwriting, independent scientists just keep on churning out uh, new data and new research. And this is one that just came out uh, very recently and I just wrote about this. Not only now are we worried about glyphosate and cancer, but there's increasing evidence that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor, meaning it can interfere with hormones, with the immune system. Um, endocrine disrupting chemicals you know, are really, really dangerous um, in so many, so many ways. And these researchers in this paper found that glyphosate has eight of the 10 key characteristics of an endocrine disrupting chemical. And that we really need to be mindful of this and regulators need to be paying attention to this evolving science. Slide. And I, I'd like to point out, it's not just us people, right, at risk. It's not just us humans. Um, it's the rest of the, the world that we share uh, with slide here with birds um, and insects and, and others that make up, you know, the, the rich biodiversity of our planet. Um, this is information from North America, Canada, and the United States, 
but we're seeing just the, the number of birds plummeting um, from, you know, fallen 3 billion uh, since 1970. And this is all due to, you know, a range of, of issues. Habitat loss is an important one. Pesticide use is, is a big one that scientists uh, are concerned about. And then you see, slide, what some people call the insect apocalypse, um, seeing a decline in important insect populations around the world. More than 40% of insect species uh, are in decline or endangered. And again, scientists are telling us um, that intensive agriculture and pesticide use, heavy pesticide use, is a main factor uh, in this important loss. Slide. So I'd like to harken back to, I guess, uh, my inspiration. Um, Rachel Carson is an important scientist and author uh, who warned us many, many, many decades ago of the indiscriminate use of pesticides and how they could be dangerous to our, our humanity, um, to the future of our world. She was focused on DDT uh, and on the effect on, on birds and songbirds, thus the name of her book, Silent Spring. Um, and my book and my work right now is focused very much on glyphosate uh, and Monsanto. But again, you know, we are a world um, fast becoming awash in pesticides. And all around us, we're seeing the evidence of the damage uh, that we're doing by literally poisoning our air and our water and our food and our own bodies and the future for our children. Um, we, we owe it to them uh, to pay attention and do better and to not listen to the messages uh, of the powerful corporate interests uh, who so often dominate and control our regulators and confuse us with their messages, we need to really look to the science and uh, to the evidence. So I want to close with this quote from Rachel Carson. If having endured much, we have at last asserted our right to know, and if by knowing we have concluded that we are being asked to take senseless and frightening risks, then we should no longer accept the counsel of those who tell us that we must fill our world with poisonous chemicals. We should look about and see what other course is open to us. And I cannot encourage that enough. Thank you.